All right. Hello and welcome, everyone. This is Caleb from TASC at the National Rural Health Resource Center. Today is Wednesday, May 16th, and this is our TASC 90 webinar. And we have Ashima Butler and Steve Kelly from Ellenville Regional Hospital in New York, along with Karen Madden from the State Office of Rural Health in New York, to chat about some of their efforts. Um, combating their opioid crisis and some of the projects and efforts that they've had. Our learning objectives are to learn about the development and outcomes of Ellenville's, Ellenville Hospital's initiative, building a continuum of care for chronic pain patients who are heavily reliant on ED services for pain management, to understand the role the FLEX program has played in supporting their community engagement initiatives, including some of the resources and opportunities for FLEX programs to address substance abuse challenges, and um, using a quantitative system and a charting tool to track utilization of hospital emergency department use by chronic pain patients and utilization of opioids with those patients. So join me in welcoming our guest speakers for the day. And before we hear from, from Ellenville and Karen from New York, we will have a few updates. And those updates will begin with uh, the updates from the Task Center and Joaquina Scott and Sarah Young from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy will provide updates on regulatory um, issues concerning critical access hospitals as well as the, the Federal Office from the FLEX program. Uh, Arkita, Sarah Brinkman from the Rural Quality Improvement Technical Assistance um, Center will provide updates as well as John Gale from the Flex Monitoring Team and then we'll hear for Karen, from Karen and the team from Ellenville and then we will open that up for questions uh, as we go throughout. Um, so star two will unmute your line if you have any questions and please utilize the chat feature if you are not being heard and you have any questions. If no one has anything, I will go ahead and start with the task update. A reminder that I'm sure Sarah will remind you of, the Flex Grant extension is due May 24th. Thank you everyone who sent in sections for review to the task team. We always appreciate being helpful in your efforts and being able to provide assistance as you submit uh, your continuing uh, applications. Please let Nicole Clement know if you'd like to have a call with a subject matter expert. The deadline to request a phone call is this Friday, and calls need to be completed by the 4th of June. These calls are free and an opportunity to learn more about a topic area. Um, ask your questions and brainstorm new ideas or new approaches. There were many center staff as well as tasks staff at the National Rural Health Association's annual meeting last week in New Orleans. It was, a great, uh, it was great to see everyone and learn about the new efforts throughout the country. Um, the Population Health Portal has, has two new data scenarios, ED utilization and mental health shortage and transportation and health status. So please take, take, a, take a moment and review the the new updates to the Population Health Portal. Uh, links can be found on the website. Registration is open for the reverse site visit July 17th and 18th in Washington, D.C. So look, um, go ahead and, and register and make your hotel and uh, lodging and travel reservations for that. If you are a fiscal year 17, um, fiscal year 17 supplemental funding state, that is doing work with your hospitals on substance use, you will receive an email invitation today to attend an in-person meeting um, on July 19th, so the day following the reverse site visit. So keep an eye out for that and um, plan your lodging and hotels accordingly if you are a supplemental state um, providing resources and training towards uh, for substance use and abuse uh, for your hospitals. The June task, 
Task VKG webinar will focus on board education or engagement and leadership support. So keep an eye out for more details on that. The date of that is June 4th. Um, and we will have a task, uh, task in cooperation with SHIRT is holding a small group meeting next week in Minneapolis focused on financial indicators, updating the Critical Access Hospital uh, Finance 101 guide and expanding that um, through, through the, out one of the outcomes of the meeting will be expanding that guide to uh, have more relevancy for small rural hospitals as, as well as rural health clinics. So we look forward to, um, to seeing the few people who will be attending this meeting and sharing the outcomes with you guys. Those are all the updates I have. Are there any questions for the task team? Star two to unmute your line or please utilize the chat feature. Not hearing any questions or comments for the task team, I will let Joaquina and Sarah provide the federal office updates as well as the um, regulatory updates. Star two will unmute your line, guys. Thank you, Caleb. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have a few updates for uh, policy to bring to your attention today. Uh, first is the CMS request for information on direct provider contracting model. This model that they're proposing is, uh, or actually seeking information from stakeholders on, would allow um, CMS to enter into agreements with primary care practices, uh, whereby those practices will be able to receive a fixed per beneficiary per month payment to cover primary care services. So uh, again, CMS has been hinting at for a while that they were interested in doing something with, with this uh, direct provider contracting model. Uh, and again, they are seeking comments for it. Comments are due by May 25th and can be submitted uh, electronically or via email to the email that I have indicated on the slide here. A couple of the questions uh, in particular that they're interested in receiving feedback on from stakeholders, it relates to how uh, such DPC model can be designed to attract a wide variety of practices, including small and independent practices and or physicians. Uh, what type of support physicians or practices would need from CMS to, to be able to participate in a DPC model? What type of outreach would be needed uh, or support to conduct outreach to patients uh, and enroll them in such model? How could they structure payment? So how could they structure this per beneficiary per month payment such that practices of various sizes would be able to participate? and also assuring financial safeguards or protections for practices. And also, how can the different types of ACOs and the current challenges they face um, be able to participate, if so, with such DTC model, or how would that interact with ACOs? And so they're looking to see, you know, would a DPC model help address certain physician practice specific needs or physician practices, um, or if physician practices will prefer refinement to existing ACO initiatives to better accommodate the physician-led ACOs. So uh, again, we encourage you to take a look at this request for information and um, share it with other stakeholders in your states to, to take a closer look and provide comments to CMS. The other update I wanted to bring to your attention is the fiscal year 2019 Medicare Hospital Inpatient Prospective Payment System uh, proposed rule. So this rule was published earlier this month. Again, it is a proposed rule, so they are accepting comments through June 25th. And a couple of things to highlight. Uh, well, one overall, they're looking to have a uh, slight increase for some of the rural hospitals that are subject to 
the IPPS payment updates, and I do note that CAS are not subject to these IPPS payment updates. Uh, the rule, the proposed rule, actually extends as part of the Bipartisan Budget Act. It extends.
strengthens the Medicare Dependent Hospital Program as well as the low volume hosp hospital payment adjustment. Uh, and it also provides uh, some updates to five hospital quality programs, including the Hospital Inpatient Quality Reporting Program, the uh, Hospital Acquired Conditions Reduction Program, the Hospital Value Based Purchasing Program, and the Medicare and Medicaid elect Electronic Health Records Incentive Program. And I know for that last one, they're looking to actually rename it and uh, call it the Promoting Interoperability Program. So in each of those programs, they're pro uh, proposing several things, whether it be removing uh, quality measures or um, adding some new measures to these programs. And uh, also I wanted to bring to your attention uh, that there are two opportunities really that are kind of added to this proposed rule, which is a request for comment and where CMS is like formally seeking um, comments from stakeholders on, uh, on various issues. So the first is on the Medicare wage index. They're looking for providers or stakeholders in general to provide comment on uh, or feedback on the Medicare wage index and ways that it can be changed or any suggestions or recommendations for changes to the Medicare wage index. Uh, they said that, for example, some stakeholders in recent years have expressed the belief that the existing wage index disparities between high and low wage index areas are too great, particularly for rural hospitals or financially struggling hospitals. Uh, the other opportunity for feedback where it's kind of buried in this proposed rule is related to promoting interoperability. Uh, and so in this case here, CMS is seeking comment on whether there should be new or revised conditions of participation that will require providers, including hospitals and critical access hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, home health agencies, et cetera, to be able to transmit patient discharge data electronically. Uh, I was recently at the um, NRHA's annual conference in New Orleans last uh, week, and we did our uh, pretty much our annual Medicare policy session. And um, was very I was very happy that Carol Blackford uh, from CMS was able to join and give a lot of these updates. And uh, she also provided an update on the IPPS rule and. You know, the, these requests for comments, even though it's kind of like buried in the proposed rule, I, I do note that, you know, some of the stakeholders are paying attention to it because Carol did actually get a question directly related to, um, you know, this request for information on interoperability and how CMS could uh, pretty much put the onus on providers versus vendors for uh, having some type of interoperability requirement. So, Carol's response was that you know, this is the opportunity to provide those types of comments to CMS, uh, particularly in that case, it was more of a concern. Uh, and so again, uh, I wanted to just bring this to your attention and encourage you or encourage your stakeholders to, um, to provide comment. Again, comments are due by June 25th, and I provided a link to that proposed rule for you. Uh, also, a couple other updates. For rural health clinics, I think from my last update, I didn't mention that in addition to the Medicare Benefits Policy Manual for rural health clinics and FQACs being updated, also Appendix G, which is the State Operations Manual for rural health clinics, um, was also updated. And we've also heard things from from uh, comments from various stakeholders about that particular update. For one, just to share. Um, amount of details and, and the length of this document going from about 20-something pages to 90 pages in length. So uh, CMS certainly did put a lot more detail in terms of the, um, the operations for rural health clinics in this updated manual. And one thing we're continuing to track is whether or not they would make any changes based on stakeholder feedback. The uh, most, um, I guess, vocal and common concern I've heard from rural health clinics to date has been the, um, the example CMS puts in the operations manual saying that they would have to keep, uh, you know, anti snake anti venom syrup uh, in their, um, uh, you know, stockpile 
uh, just in, in case <laughs> of an emergency or in case that is needed. And a lot of rural health clinics say, well, you know, we don't see a lot of beneficiaries with snake bites. And if we did, we most likely will refer them to the emergency room because there's concern with even administering such anti um, anti-venom as well. So um, again, those are some of the things that I think CMS is aware of, but again, I wanted to just provide you with that link so that you will be aware of it in case there are any of your, uh, any of the critical access hospitals in your state kind of bring some of these concerns related to their provider base, rural health clinics to your attention. And then finally, uh, if you haven't heard by now, CMS did roll out the rural health strategy um, and we were aware of them rolling this out before they they uh, they put it out there for the public. And I'll just remind you again of the top um, five objectives for their strategy, which is applying a rural lens to CMS programs and policies. That's something that we're excited to see and uh, really will be working on, especially as we get various of regulations through clearance, um, we really will be relying on this overall strategy in working with CMS as we provide comments to them and feedback. Uh, second objective is to improve access to care through provider engagement and support. Third, advance telehealth and telemedicine. Fourth, empower patients in rural communities to make decisions about their health care. And five, leverage partnerships to achieve the goals of the CMS rural health strategy. So of course, if you have any questions related to these updates, please feel free to send us your questions to our rural policy um, email inbox, ruralpolicy at hrsa.gov. Thank you. Thank you, Arkina. Do we have any questions for Joaquina before Sarah's update? All right, hearing none, I'll let you have the floor, Sarah. Thanks, Caleb. And I am very interested in hearing about Ellen Bill's project, so I'm going to keep my updates very short. Um, first, as a follow-up comment on these policy updates that Wakina shared with us, I hope if you are interested in these issues, you are already signed up on to get the weekly announcements from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. And if you aren't, um, go to our website or contact Wakina or me, and we will help you get signed up because that um, Wakina provides updates in that newsletter every week as soon as new CMS proposed rules and requests for information and other updates like this come out. So it's a great way to stay on top of things. And as she was saying, um, these requests for information and requests for comment really are your best opportunity to provide feedback to CMS in a format where they can consider rural issues and act on them. So I just wanted to highlight how important it was to stay on top of these policy issues and thank Joaquina again for sharing them with us. Uh, Caleb stole most of my announcements or maybe did them for me. So uh, the upcoming meetings and due dates I will remind folks that if you are applying for the EMS Sustainability Project extra funding, that funding request is actually due Friday, May 18th. That is this Friday. And of course, your um, progress reports and funding extension requests for your primary flex grants for FY18 are due next Thursday, May 24th. Um, for both of those, if you run into any problems in EHB or any other issues, contact your project officers right away. And a big thank you to the team at TASC for helping folks um, prepare those progress reports and reviewing sections of your document that otherwise being a help and a resource as everyone is putting their plans together for the coming year. Once you submit those um, documents in EHB, your project officer will be copying them down and we will be doing our reviews. And if we have questions or identify sections that need revisions, um, we will be reaching out to you and letting you know about that. So that is what you can expect from us over the next month um, and reach out with questions. And definitely as you are planning your travel for the reverse site visit, be sure you plan your travel and other flights so you can stay 
for the full uh, length of our second day, so that's Wednesday, we have um, invited a very interesting speaker from CMS for our closing uh, closing presentation, which goes until 3.30, I believe, on Wednesday. And you do not want to have to leave early and miss that presentation. So just keep that in mind as you are making your travel plans. And we really look forward to seeing everyone here in D.C. in July. And that was all I had, Caleb. Thank you, ma'am. Are there any questions for Sarah or Joaquina? Star 2 will unmute your line or please utilize the chat feature. Hearing none and seeing none, uh, Sarah Brinkman from Arkita, are you on and able to unmute your line? I believe so. I can hear you just fine. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I just have a very um, few updates for you all regarding the work that we're doing with Arkita and some MBQIP updates. For those of you that were able to participate in our last VKG call, these will look very familiar to you. Um, so one of the recent uh, resource updates that we have is that the Interpreting MBQIP Hospital Data Reports for Quality Improvement Guide was updated, um, and that reflects the addition of ED1 and 2 um, into that resource. We have a number of resources that we anticipate will be uh, published and posted to the TASC website um, in the next few weeks or within the next month, including an update to the National Quality Reporting Crosswalk, um, an ECQM resource list for cause. So this one has been in the works now for quite a while. It's been finalized a couple of times, and literally every time we go to post it, CMS sends out an email with a new update. So, um, so we are working working feverishly to make sure that that is as up-to-date as possible and then also we'll be maintaining updates to it going forward. As Makina mentioned, there's a lot going on around ECQMs um, and that IPPS proposed rule had a lot of information in it about ECQMs as well. Uh, we've heard your request and we're working on uh, publishing a, a resource that will provide you with anticipated release dates for your MBQIP data report, so watch for that. That will be posted along with an MBQIP fundamentals guide for state flex programs. Um, and uh, that guide really is to get to for state flex programs in particular to really understand how MBQIP came into being, what the basics of the program are now, a little bit of historical reference points, um, really to be able to provide you with the nuts and bolts of the program so someone who's new to your organization or who is new to the program um, can, can be brought up to speed relatively quickly. We know we have a lot of resources out there. This is an oppor this is a opportunity for us to try to pull them pull the key resources together for you. And then um, the CDC NHSN Annual Facility Survey Instructions, that's actually a resource that was put together by the CDC. It has been posted on the CDC's website. I anticipate that it will be made uh, public on the TASC website sometime probably at this week. And if so, you'll be seeing an update about that when we send out our MBQIP monthly um, next Wednesday. As far as upcoming events, we do have two of MBQIP VKGs scheduled yet through August of this year, so one on June 21st, one on August 16th, and we're excited to see you all in between at the reverse site visit in July. Um, for the June 21st call, we're doing something a little bit different this time, so please watch your emails uh, for a request for some feedback from you in the form of a survey. We're looking to gather information from all of you about the various ways that you're collaborating with different partners and stakeholders in your states to support your critical access hospitals. Um, and we want to try to pull some of that data together ahead of time so that we, we know that we've got lots to talk about and um, can have a rich discussion with you all. So that's all I have for today. I'll turn it back to Caleb unless there's any questions. Star two, or please utilize the chat feature for any questions for Sarah or the Arkita team. All right, I am looking for John Gale for an update from the Flex Monitoring team. Were you able to join us, John?
anyone else from the Flex Monitoring team able to join us? Hearing none, I think we will go ahead and learn about fighting the opioid crisis from our visitors from Ellenville Regional Hospital. We have Steve Kelly and Ashima Butler from Ellenville Regional Hospital. I will let you guys provide a little bit of an, up, um, an update or, uh, oh, I can't think of it, an intro for yourselves once our participants have completed the, the little assessment beforehand. And uh, yeah, so give us just a minute and then we'll get started. Please take a moment to complete the survey. And Caleb, this is Sarah Young again. While folks are completing the survey, I just want to draw everyone's attention to the chat box where I posted a link about the press release on the upcoming HRSA opioid funding opportunity. Um, folks on this call may well be interested in that if you haven't already seen it too. Thank you, Sarah. It looks like we're still getting a few votes or uh, people to complete the poll. So please, if you've not had a chance, go ahead and complete the poll and we'll get started on our presentation from Ellenville Regional Hospital in New York. All right, this is uh, Steve Kelly and Ashma Butler. We, were, we thought that Karen Madden might have a few words of introduction if she's on. I am on Steve, thank you. Um, I, I just want to thank the folks at TASC for um, taking the information that we sent to them regarding the program that Ellenville developed and implemented to address the opioid crisis in their community and um, recognizing it for um, the great work that it is and bringing it all to you today. Um, just real quickly, our, our, my intro is that um, it is always my pleasure to work with the critical access hospitals in our state, a big part of what we do here in the office, and um, Ellenville Regional Hospital is always at the top of the list whenever we have any kind of initiative that comes to us that, that we'd, like to see, um, we'd like to see done in the hospitals, and they always do it very well. So I thank them for that, and I thank them for their willingness to share their story with you today. Um, they, they recognize um, the need in their community to do something about um, the impact that opioids were having, as I'm sure the hospitals in all of your states are, are, trying, are either addressing or trying to address. And um, as is their nature, they, they looked at the problem, developed what they thought might be a solution, and went about implementing it. At the time, um, we were and we still are implementing in New York State of, of a very large statewide Medicaid reform initiative, and they were able to do this project as part of the work that they're doing with their region on, on Medicaid reform. So I think that um, Steve and Ashma will probably get to a little bit of that in their presentation. They, um, as they were implementing the project, they came to us um, in the office and discussed what they were doing. And of course, we were very interested, so we, um, invited them to bring to to present that to our network of community <laughs> critical access hospitals that meet every quarter. That uh, a presentation was done, I think, two quarters ago, and over at, at our next meeting in June, we'll be um, the, they'll be doing a more in-depth presentation because our hope is that we can we can um, use this as a pilot so that more of our critical access hospitals implement this, and we're hoping to be able to do it on more of a statewide basis. So um, hopefully we'll be able to do that and maybe come back to you in a, in a couple of years to let you know what the results of that were. But again, I thank you for your interest and I thank Steve and Ashima for their time 
and I'll hand it over to them. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Karen. Let me see if I can uh, advance here. All right. So I'm Steve Kelly, and it didn't work. All right. So let's see. Maybe right. The arrow's at the bottom. There. All right. So um, we're here to talk to you about our response to the opioid crisis um, here in New York. This is a, a project that's really important. We're in a rural part of New York. Many uh, folks around the country think of New York as a giant city that kind of spreads from New York to Buffalo. And in fact, much of New York is really quite rural. And um, we are in one of those areas that is quite rural. We're in the Catskill Mountains. We're in a valley. Um, we're geographically isolated. And I'll get to a little bit about us in a few minutes. But let me talk a little bit about the, the crisis. Um, you know, for about 100 years, the life expectancy in the United States went up a little bit almost every year until 2016 when it went down. And it went down because of the large number of people dying of drug overdoses. In fact, it went up about 400% since 1999, and today, overdose deaths are, in fact, the leading cause of death for people under 50. This is just an unprecedented uh, crisis. So um, when we look at, at what people die of, they mostly die from heroin or fentanyl, or a combination of heroin and fentanyl. And this fentanyl is so much more powerful than heroin that it is really it is driving the deaths more and more. So the um, let me advance my slide. So sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, and I have no shortage of thousands of words. But this picture here, if you just look at this, this shows the overdose uh, deaths involving opioids in the United States for the last 15 years or so. And you can see it's just like going straight up. It is really, really a giant problem. So about three years ago, we endeavored uh, to do something about it. And as we did that, we learned more about it. And we found out that a major part of the problem was that 75% of the people who are on heroin started out on prescription drugs. And so we look at, we found out that there's been a 400% increase in the amount of prescription opioids that have been sold uh, through pharmacies, hospitals, and doctor's offices uh, over the last 10 years. And it's just amazing that this has happened. And so of the three quarters of the people who are on heroin that started on prescription drugs, many of them started out. Uh, as a result of a medical or dental procedure, a car accident, or other type of, of um, injury, and just were prescribed, over-prescribed heroin, and be, or not heroin, over-prescribed opiates, and became addicted. Others were from um, diversion of opiates that were uh, prescribed to somebody that didn't use them all, and um, there's all kinds of things that are going on that are really you wouldn't think of, such as people going on house tours for open houses, for houses that are for sale so they can rummage through the medicine cabinets to see if there's any old opiates in there. And so the, the problem is just has just spiraled out of control. Um, another thing that we're finding out about uh, is, are something called Lazarus parties. Now, Lazarus was a biblical figure who was brought back to life by Jesus in the Bible. There are young people, primarily, who are having Lazarus parties where they are overdosing on heroin or fentanyl deliberately together as a group, and they have one person who remains sober and uses naloxone to revive them. So they get to right to death's door, and then they get revived. 
this is one of the, I guess, uh, side effects of having naloxone being so widely available. There's some pluses to it. We have we save lives, but it in, it does not necessarily reduce any addiction. And in fact, from what we're hearing, is encouraging even more risky behavior than before. So this is a very serious problem. And while the deaths have tapered off a little bit in 2017. Um, we don't think the problem has gone away at all. So let me give you a little bit of background about our partners. Uh, Ellenville Regional Hospital is a, a critical access hospital located in uh, kind of lower Hudson Valley of New York, about halfway between Albany and New York City in a mountainous area to the west of the Hudson River. We're a 25-bed hospital. We have approximately 14,000 ER visits. And on our campus is, and physically adjoined to us, is a uh, part of the largest federally qualified healthcare center in New York that's actually based in Manhattan, the Institute for Family Health. And I'll talk a little bit about them in a couple minutes. So what we did is we went through our emergency departments and identified high utilization patients that were coming here due to chronic pain. And we went through a process of selecting the highest utilization patients, those that came five or more times in a six month period that were prescribed opiates, and developed a cohort. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But when we look at the number of, of patients that presented for chronic pain, it amounted to over 2,000 visits and over 800 patients. So um, while some of them, many of them only came once, uh, quite a number of them came quite repeatedly and are being or were being treated episodically for chronic conditions. Uh, and these are, these are patients that when they come to the ER, they're very disruptive patients. They, they have pain that's a, a 12 on a scale of 1 to 10. Um, very, very difficult patients. They will say and do anything to get the fix that they're looking for. So anyway, so that's the background on our hospital. Our partners, the Institute for Family Health, large FQHC, Federally Qualified Healthcare Center. They have 32 locations around lower New York State. They're in Manhattan, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and have a number of locations in the Hudson Valley, one of the smaller ones being on our campus. They serve about 100,000 patients a year. Last year they did 560,000 visits uh, between medical, dental, and uh, mental health. They've been nationally recognized as one of the most advanced EPIC users in the country and, and really our uh, premier organization to work with. And um, we're very, very fortunate to have them as our partner on, on this project and actually many others. So the project goal was to reduce emergency department high utilizer visits by employing a multidisciplinary standardized approach and ensuring that appropriate alternatives were accessible to maximize long-term outcomes. So that, that's a you know, pretty, pretty big goal. But essentially, there are other programs out there for reducing opiates in the emergency department, but do not really address the problems that are the underlying problems. So, as we get into this, we'll be describing how our program does do that. The action team that we put together were the hospital emergency department providers, the hospital administrators, that would be Ashma as the project leader and myself as the CEO and, and uh, the emergency department nurse uh, leadership. We also worked with the health center providers and the health center administrators. Those are the folks from uh, the Institute for Family Health. And we 
implemented care navigation, which is really a health home uh, model, which the Institute is the local health home provider. And so we engaged that group as well, and that turned out to be a really critical part of the success was having good care navigation. So we went to the medical staff and we started out with the department leaders in the emergency department and we asked them uh, to participate in a project to reduce ER visits and to reduce opiate administration in the emergency department. And the immediate reaction was we had one person who was a little contrite and didn't think that that was such a great idea, we shouldn't have administration telling us how to practice medicine. And, and I said, you know, you should be thanking me because I'm enabling you to practice medicine properly because you know you shouldn't be giving out all of these opiates. You should be giving out a lot, lot less. And you know that. And so you come up with all kinds of expensive interventions where you radiate people and do all kinds of expensive lab tests to be able to justify giving them opiates that you know that they really shouldn't be getting because it's a fine line between treating pain and enabling addiction. And remarkably, all of their colleagues sort of piled on and said, of course we want to do that and we will be part of the solution. We want to help you do this and we can't wait to have these, develop these protocols ourselves. So the department actually developed opiate administration protocols, uh, best practices, and, and those uh, protocols were put into policy format. They were brought to the medical executive committee, which unanimously approved them also. We took it to the entire medical staff who approved the protocols. We brought it to the board of directors who voted to endorse it also, although they're not obviously clinical, but this is a policy change. And we reached out to the local providers that were not part of the Institute for Family Health and included them also so that all of the community providers were participating in, in this process. So, um, so what we did is we also included the, uh, well, this is the cohort pathway. So what happened is the patient would arrive in the emergency department and we had them flagged in our electronic health record. We bring them in. We would assess them to make sure that there was not something new that was medically going on which we did have in many, not many, but in some cases with this cohort. We contacted their primary, uh, their primary provider and let them know that their patient was here. We, we checked with iStop, which is New York's um, prescription, prescription, thank you, Ashima, mm -hmm. prescription monitoring program to see if they had other opiates prescribed by folks besides their PCP, as well as from their PCP. We called the care navigator to let them know that, that, these patients, that this patient was here. And we, we, we decided not to give them opiates in almost every case and had a warm handoff to the care navigator. And the role of the care navigator was to channel the patient through the system uh, to get them into primary care, and then there would be a medical assessment for, from a, a physician at the Institute for Family Health, and they would decide uh, through different pathways what was the best way to treat the patient. If the patient was uh, withdrawing from uh, opiates, they might, they might prescribe Suboxone and treat them that way. If the patient, they felt uh, the patient had a underlying medical uh, pain problem, they might refer them to a pain specialist who would do injections or other types of local 
analgesics rather than systemically medicating the patient with opiates. And they would have the care managers, or they had a psychiatrist also to help deal with addiction along with the Suboxone. They also had the care navigators be continually involved with the patient to help them navigate the system and to provide the follow-up pieces, the follow-up, I know, yes, yeah, the follow-up pieces so that they would be getting care um, through the, the Institute for Family Health's different providers and other providers. They may refer them in for other types of counseling and things that the Institute didn't offer or social services because people who have addiction also have a lot of other things going on. They have problems with their family. They have problems with, with work. They have problems with uh, homelessness and, and all kinds of problems. And so we were able to, um, to really start addressing their needs, which really aren't being addressed in the emergency department. In the emergency department, they were there really often to kind of get a fix, and we were part of the problem of uh, enabling the addiction. So I'm going to turn the uh, the turn this over now to Ashima, who is going to talk about more the nuts and bolts of of uh, how we went about actually operationalizing this vision of um, reducing opiates in the ER and channeling patients into a rehabilitative pathway. Um, I want to thank Karen and um, all the listeners on this webinar today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, so Steve talked about our ED. We have about 14,000 uh, visits annually in our ED. And when we looked at the data initially, we were like, how are we going to tackle this problem? How do we come to a data set that is manageable so we can track this cohort to really um, come to a conclusion that we're able to impact uh, this chronic pain manage, uh, chronic pain um, issue that we're dealing with um, and trying to handle it through opioids. So with the ED manager, we kind of ran through our ED EMR report and we pulled up to we ran a report to see how many patients presented to the ED in six months that had a chief complaint of chronic pain. And when we ran through the data, we right away saw that there were 819 patients who came in a six-month period to our ED between May and October, and um, those 819 patients were in the ED a total of 1,927 times, and we were, uh, we were shocked. We were like, how could that be possible? So we were like, okay, that's too big a cohort to manage. We possibly can track 819 patients. So we said, let's establish some criteria further. So we said they had to present to the ED five or more visits in this time frame, in the six-month time frame, and had to be treated with opioids of some sort. And when we were talking about treatment with opioids, we were looking at intravenous, intramuscular or subcutaneously. We ruled out the oral because sometimes we do have a trauma situation where we do have to treat with opioids or, you know, uh, occasionally a dental pain, like Steve said, that might need oral uh, PO opioids. And out of those 819 patients, one, once we had the criteria uh, pushed through, we were able to identify 64 patients. And these 64 patients became our cohort that we've been tracking for the past three years. We're going to be coming up on three years this October. And these um, 64 patients have four groups uh, that they can be categorized in. And obviously, they have an overlap. So many of these patients have a genuine chronic pain management issue. Uh, they also have other medical conditions. They do have addiction and uh, a huge need for mental and behavioral health. So there's a lot of overlap. Um, not any of the patients, there was not a single patient who did not fall in um, less than one category or subgroup. For the project data collection, the key elements that we required which were necessary for our staff 
uh, to be able to identify these patients as they presented to the ED. Uh, as soon as registration um, registered a patient, our EMR had given us the ability to be able to flag these patients in the system. So right away, a little pop-up note would come up uh, once registration was completed, which triggered uh, the triage nurse that we had a max patient here, uh, part of the cohort, and on this post-it note in the EMR, uh, what the clerk would do every time there was a visit, uh, would type in the notes as to how many visits have this patient has had in the past month or so, what they presented with, and um, what was the underlying reason for their visit. And this is all going behind the scene. The patient, patient is not privy to this. This is all happening simultaneously while the patient is being registered and the triage nurse is looking at this. So as soon as the patient comes into um, the ED, like uh, Steve talked about, the patients being flagged in the EMR, uh, the patient is triaged right away. Um, obviously, that we know they're part of the cohort. Um, um, we do a medical screen right away because we want to make sure, rule out that it's an actual emergency or not, because if it is an emergency, Obviously, everything is put aside. We don't care whether it's a max patient or not. We need to take care of the patient. That comes first. But if it indeed is a max patient and they are really there for, and I hate to use the word fix, um, then there are other steps that the ED staff take right away. A care navigation call is activated right away by the clerk. Um, the other clerk or the PCT, which is the patient care tech, pulls up the iStop registry to enable the provider to make sure that he can log in and check when their last prescription was filled. Uh, they also simultaneously check if the patient has some sort of a pain contract with their primary care provider. A call is placed to the primary care provider, hey, John Smith is in the ED again. John Smith was in the ED two days ago. We had called you. They said they were coming in and you were going to take these uh, steps, and they're back. So we're going to be treating them, but after doing a warm handoff to the care navigator, the care navigator is going to give you the information as to why they presented to the ED. Um, one of the things that um, was uh, happening for us was care navigation was only available from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. So if it was a crisis situation after hours, after 5 o'clock or over the weekend, we had access to a crisis hotline through Institute for Family Health, and we also are provided um, crisis mobile units through Catholic Charities of New York, who uh, we, we just need to do one call. So if there is truly an emergency where the patient needs to be taken into some sort of detox or uh, lockdown of some sort, uh, they come in and assist and take the patient off of the ED staff's hands and handle the situation for us. So this is all going on as the patient presents to the ED. Once the care navigator comes over, um, and I put in there IFH action and intervention, kind of want to give you an overview of what the Institute for Family Health, who offers these care navigation services to us, what they do at their end once we have uh, warmly handed off the patient to them after ruling out that it is not an emergency. The care navigator, we have a little office where either they can meet right in the hospital or walk right next door to their offices, and the care navigator will educate the patient, and sometimes multiple times, about the appropriate ED usage. Try to have a conversation, a dialogue as to, Mr. Smith, why are you here today? I just saw you two days ago. Last time you were here, you said that you were having a housing issue. I hooked you up with this. I did these. I took these steps. What's going on today? And Mr. Smith at that point might say, you know what? I was lonely. I was having anxiety. I needed somebody to talk to. ED is always friendly. I always come to the ED because they make me feel so special. And we've had genuine patient concerns where people are socially isolated. They don't have food. They don't have transportation to get their prescription, so they call the ambulance. The ambulance can't refuse bringing them to the hospital um, because they're saying they're in extreme pain. 
So these are cases that the care navigator was handling for us. If it is a pain management issue or um, mental health issue, care navigator is the one who made sure that these people were, were linked up. Steve had mentioned the health home piece of it. Um, all the Medicaid recipients um, out of the 64 patients, about a third of the patients were Medicaid recipients, and we automatically en enrolled them into the health home program, so they were getting all the services under that umbrella. Um, IFH also has a very similar EMR flag in their system. So what they did, they also created uh, 64 patient profiles for the cohort in their system to make sure that they were updating that also simultaneously. So we both had same information, and I'll tell you why we did that on my next slide. Um, through the project, what we're doing with the Institute is we initially started doing biweekly conferences. And this was done in an effort to make sure that the 64 patients that we were monitoring, that we had a solid grasp, grasp and understanding as to why these patients were presenting and what actions both the ED and the Institute were taking to take care of these patients. Um, we updated the care plan with the drivers of utilization, basically giving a care navigation team an insight as to what we thought were the issues uh, that the ED patients were presenting with. And then care navigation updated that care profile um, saying this patient was hooked up with their PCP, they were hooked up with a social services agency, they had counseling appointments, home health services, health home referrals, addiction services, whatever it may be. And every two weeks we met, so when the patient came back the next time, the ED provider had the backup information that they needed to share with the uh, patient that, hey, Brian was your care navigator. We saw that we took these steps with you, and yet you're back in the ED. Tell us what's going on. So this was all critical to um, make the project successful for us. Um, Steve talked about the chronic pain management policy. Um, that speaks to the practice change right in the ED. Um, it empowered our providers to be able to tell the patients that, look, I can't offer you opioids. This is the hospital policy. It's a stringent policy. Um, yes, I know you're in extreme pain, but I have alternatives that I can offer you, including a pain management referral. I can hook you up with an acupuncturist, um, chiropractic care, massage therapy, whatever you may need. Uh, I can hook you up for services through our care navigation team. Um, the other thing that the ED is doing consistently is checking the prescription monitoring program, ISTOP, and um, really, really establishing a close connection with our pain management specialist. We have two in the area who offer services, and uh, we were making constant referrals. In-house training and education, very critical. So everybody is giving the same consistent man uh, message to the patients that are coming into the ED beyond the 64 patients. So anybody new that's coming in for chronic pain, they're getting the same protocols and the same messaging that we're giving to the 64 patient cohort. Um, increased screening and referral. Uh, SBAR training is available to us. Uh, we made sure that our ED staff did that, our ED providers mainly. Um, we staff our emergency room with advanced practice professionals, mainly nurse practitioners and PAs. We have a doctor available to respond within a half hour if there is uh, an emergency above and beyond what they're uh, able to handle. And we made all these providers uh, go through the expert training so they were able to assist the care navigation team um, if needed. Um, I think we talked about what the care navigation team does. The one thing that I do want to point out is that the Institute um, for Family Health um, is looking into offering uh, buprenorphine expansion. Uh, we are asking for our primary care providers. I know New York State has just issued a waiver 
uh, where the provider, if they want to um, become a Suboxone provider, can just take the eight 13 hour class, I think it's eight hours and five hours, and then they can request for a waiver to be able to um, offer Suboxone. So the Institute for Family Health is going to be offering that in our area, and we highly recommend that um, for anybody who's looking to um, start this project. Potential roles of healthcare providers and institutions. This is where um, I'm going to have Steve jump in a little bit as to what um, our community, our providers need to do beyond the education. Um, I will have you speak about the hospital pharmacy and the naloxone availability, Steve, with the police department. Oh, okay, yes. So we worked with uh, the local police department and made naloxone um, really available, very available in the community. We have the kits available, uh, as do the Institute for Family Health, for anyone who wants them. Um, we, when we have identified families that have family members who are using, we encourage them to, to be educated and to have naloxone available because they just never know when they're going to need it. We think that that has, has acted to save lives. Um, at least that's what people have told us. We think that while it's a great idea, that isn't really solving the problem. It's just solving the problem, the part of where people are dying so frequently. Um, and so that's really the main parts of this slide. I think we've already covered the other things here. So the challenges that we, we identified as we've been doing this for a few years is that since we wanted to include all the community providers, we're a small community and that's somewhat practical, but it really wasn't that practical because we had some we, who were very, very willing to engage with us and we had others who were a little skeptical about on the role of having a competitor run the um, the care navigation system, and we're a little skeptical of that. Uh, this is a very replicable uh, program. We are currently assisting three other hospitals that are implementing it right at this moment. Uh, we are presenting to the critical access hospitals the, uh, at their, our quarterly meeting that the FLEX program sponsors where we share operational financial and quality data every quarter and benchmark ourselves against each other. Uh, the 18 critical access hospitals in New York, that's been a little plug here for Karen and her program, has been extraordinarily successful in improving the financial, really the financial, operational, and quality outcomes uh, for New York's uh, cohort of critical access hospitals. When what, The other thing that we have found, uh, as I mentioned, we think that the overdose prevention addresses the immediate mortality, but it doesn't really solve the problem. We think it really needs to be coupled with treatment. And unless we're having people getting into treatment, we're sort of kicking the can down the road and not really solving the problem. Um, there are a lot of factors that are that are outside of our control, such as access to treatment does not mean that someone is interested in, in changing their, their behavior. Addiction is very powerful. I mean, when you, when you think about it, I often tell a story, which is a true story, of, of me walking through the hospital and walking in to the ER waiting room, which is right adjoining, right next to my office, and having a young man come running into the hospital screaming that his girlfriend is out in the car and she's not breathing. And my staff just snapped, it. it's amazing how quick they are. They rushed outside with a wheelchair. The woman, her, her lips are as blue as this slide. She is not breathing. She appears to be dead. They're giving her the naloxone, squirting that up her nose in the parking lot as they're grabbing her and throwing her into the wheelchair and rushing her inside, and it happened so quick. It was just amazing. I'm standing there almost bewildered. The administrator, who's not clinical, and is just 
overwhelmed by how effective my staff are. Meanwhile, the boyfriend is in the bathroom flushing the toilet over and over, uh, flushing away evidence, presumably. And I'm standing out in the parking lot with the car with the door open, and I notice some movement in the back seat. And I look, and there's a small child in the back seat, a small child, a toddler, probably between two and three, who's been watching mom die in the front seat. So when we think about, we think about the instincts that we have that are the most basic of instincts, protecting our children is really high at the top of that list. I mean, think about it. We don't mess with bear cubs, because we know that mama bear might be around, and her instinct is going to be to defend her cubs. So when we have something that's so strong that it overpowers basic human instincts to protect our children, that is, that is just overwhelming. So um, here's our results. Well, the end of that story was a good ending. The, we were able to revive that woman, and that child did not have to be an orphan that day. But I really use that as illustration because um, a lot of people are not really interested in, in getting help. So even if the help is available, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get it. Also, there are the social determinants of health care, and that is, uh, means that there are many things that are uh, factors that are not part of health care that, uh, that weigh heavily on, on the opiate crisis as it does on many other uh, factors of, of uh, health care. And there's also the the stigma and marginalization that is, um, is still pretty alive and well. Our results are posted here. We were able to have a pretty substantial reduction in ER visits for this population, uh, almost 73%. And we were able to reduce opioid orders uh, by uh, you know, 84, 85%. That has uh, been pretty dramatic, really. I mean, just changed the way we, we practice medicine here, changed the way that we treat our community on many levels. It is, uh, it's, we've gotten a lot of uh, visibility. We've been presenting, we presented at Modern Healthcare's Opiate Crisis Symposium in Baltimore last month. We presented at the New York State Public Health Association's annual conference last month. Uh, we've presented in lots of other places, and we're presenting here today. And we have a toolkit, so if there are hospitals in your state that might be interested in, in implementing this, we'll be glad to, uh, to help them. Um, we're not consultants. We're just small hospital administrators trying to do the best job that we can to uh, fight this crisis. And we will provide the tools to anyone that wants to do it. It isn't really that hard, I think, as we've implemented other hospitals. The roadmap is very clear. It's very simple. The, uh, doing the cohort, you can, we took you through in a fairly short amount of time what's necessary to do that. Um, the policy could just be copied. That's what other hospitals have done because since the doctors uh, developed it, the other doctors who have, have agreed with it, confirmed it, said, yeah, that looks good. We'll just change the, change the label. And, um, and then the analytics we did really using uh, just spreadsheets. There's not really high-level analytics to make it work. We think that if we're able to make it work with a 25-bed hospital, uh, pretty much anyone ought to be able to do it. So we'll answer any questions that anyone might have. Star two will unmute your line or please utilize the chat feature. We had one question about um, whether or not all electronic medical records would be able to utilize the notification system that Ellenville has. And um, I, I think it would be EHR dependent would be the answer to that. Um, but right. you guys said I, I, that you yeah, I did answer that, that we use Athena Health as our EMR, and before Athena, we used Medhost. Um, all three of the EMRs that we've had, Epic, Medhost, and Athena, have the capacity. Uh, it would really be um, 
dependent on what EMR they have in their hospital. Um, majority of the EMRs are able to accommodate a flag. Great, thank you. Um, were there, I had a question about just community or board member, were there any, was there any pushback um, from the community or did you get any negative feedback about, you know, hey, we're, we, you know, need pain management and, and if you're not providing that, then what's the, what are we doing or, you know, things like that. Was there any pushback from the community that you experienced? Yes. Um, well, you know, let me answer that a little bit, a little bit in a roundabout way. Uh, for years, we have been really focusing on patient satisfaction, and we have been holding our providers to a very high standard for patient satisfaction. We expect to be at the top of the world on that. Um, these are information that's publicly available through HCAPs and other, other methods. So there's been a lot of pressure. So in order to implement this program, we had to be willing to accept that our patient satisfaction might take a hit. And in fact, it did. So part of the deal was I had to empower our providers and protect them in the event that there was a, a reduction in patient satisfaction and have them channel anyone who had a complaint about this particular uh, policy to my office, which is immediately adjacent to the emergency department. And you have to be careful what you wish for because we certainly did field a number of complaints as we implemented the project, and we we did feel the uh, patient satisfaction hit from some very disgruntled people as we implemented this. However, I would say that over time, we recovered. Uh, our patient satisfaction today is as high or higher than it ever has been. And so um, that's a very good question because at first, as we're changing how we're treating people, there is some objection to that. And it's not that we're not treating chronic, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, please. Yeah. It's not that we're not treating pain. We are hooking them up with um, other ancillary services. Uh, they can establish a pain contract with their own primary care provider. So if they do need opioid treatment for their chronic pain condition, their primary care provider is giving them that ability. Um, they're not necessarily coming to the ED because out of the ED, we cannot give more than three doses. Um, so that's something that we established um, in conjunction with the community providers, and that has been very successful for us. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that's, I think that's, um, that's awesome. Um, and I, I may have missed this, but what, what prompted or sparked the, the interest in the opioid treatment or pain management stuff, um, uh, you know, as a 